You're listening to Asking for a Friend with therapist Stephen Ng. It's a conversation about human sexuality and how to approach it with intelligence, understanding, and compassion. Hi, this is Stephen Ng, and I'm uh, sitting here with my friend Jackie getting ready to talk about, you guessed it, sex, or as today's podcast might indicate, not sex. Apparently, we're talking about abstinence. Yeah, and not just abstinence, but abstinence only sex education. You mean teaching people to not have sex? Teaching people to not have sex. And if they do have sex, they should be ashamed. And teaching people to not have sex, that's a thing? Evidently, that's a thing. And not only is it a thing, but our government in the United States um, just increased total spending on abstinence to $100 million for 2018. Yeah, since the 80s, we spent over $2 billion on that. And you're saying that's not a good idea? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, without doing any research, I can say that that's not a good idea. But it, it, you know, the problem, I think, is it isn't trickling down to the billionaire class because there's a lot of sex going on in the billionaire class, apparently, so, judging from the news uh, lately. <laughs> so, so evidently, we need to make it so that they can make more money on birth control and condoms, and then maybe we can put the money there. Actually, you know, I think part of this, the abstinence-only program is avoiding those topics, as a matter of fact, avoiding talking about alternatives to just, you know, jumping out of the airplane with no parachute, you know, to don't have sex, don't prepare for having sex, don't take any countermeasures to getting pregnant, because that would be setting you up to have sex. So better not to get the HPV vaccine or to have birth control or have a condom in your pocket or anything else that might smack of the idea that you were thinking about it, weren't you? Because obviously the only reason that I would be thinking about it is if somebody talked to me about it. Or that you might be one of those kinds of girls. Right, right. <laughs> One of those kinds of girls who might enjoy, might actually enjoy sex or might be curious or might have hormones. Yeah, and that would that would be a certain class of girl, according to these educators, who are uh, really not clean girls. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm assuming boys come in there someplace. Yeah, they're the victims in all this. Yeah, you of know. Of their male nature and feminine wiles. It's funny. I remember when my, um, when my boys were small and people would say, um, you're so lucky you have boy children because you don't have to worry about teen pregnancy. Oh, my God. Yeah. And I said, where do you think that they're getting like, who's making them pregnant? You th you act like these girls are just doing this all on their own. And I said, here's the thing. You only have to worry about one teen pregnancy at a time with your girl. My boys. They could get any number of girls pregnant. They could pregnant. get any number of girls pregnant. Right. And, you know, for each one of those pregnancies, they're legally on the line for child support for every one of those children until they hit age 18 at a minimum. So the liability isn't just, oops, we had a baby, but oops, I now have a major financial obligation that makes the debt for student education look like nothing. I actually have a friend whose 19-year-old son got two different girls pregnant within a couple of months of each other. Yeah, and in my work, I encountered that a lot as well. You know, my problem with this abstinence-only education is is not so much based on science and the studies because the science, I mean, inevitably, we end up getting into arguments about, uh, well, whether that study was valid or it wasn't or whether there's scientific consensus or there isn't. And from the right wing, typically what we end up getting is, well, because they don't believe in science, um, sadly, uh, they typically just won't buy anything that's proven by a study or science or the preponderance of evidence. And obviously that's a, a big generalization. Well, I, I don't, can, okay, think of one extreme right wing person, you know, who loves science. I can't think of a one. I can't think of a single one. And I, you know, and here's here's the issue for me. We don't need science in a case like this. What we need is some reason. If we're wanting our children to manage their sexuality intelligently, doesn't it seem like they ought to be able to look at it and examine it? Because if they're aware of it, then they could manage it. But if we keep them ignorant, like this one boy in college who, where the class where they were talking about HPV, and he was wondering what his risk was of catching uterine cancer. Cervical cancer. Oh, cervical cancer. Cervical See, I'm cancer. not even getting it right. <laughs> you read that so too, So there's then. different parts in the female body, Stephen, that are different <laughs> than boys. It's not all one thing? It's all different parts. All right. Because, yeah. I, you know, it's, it's confusing down there. It's all up in it and invisible to my eye. So in any case, 
he's he's worried about what is obviously a female body body part. It's a little bit like a woman worrying about prostate cancer. And that's not really a thing for him. He doesn't have to worry about it. You know, the thing that really struck the teacher in that case, though, that struck me as well, is that nobody laughed. Right, because none of them knew. None of them knew. And that just seems very odd to me. So there's some basic basic science like anatomy that kids are missing out on. And by kids, I mean who are now adults, kids who are now adults in our society. But even so, in terms of sex education, abstinence would seem to play the same role as refusing to tr talk about nutrition uh, with the idea that we could prevent obesity. You know, if we, we don't want anybody to get overweight, so let's not talk about nutrition, diet, food, or caloric intake at all. And again, the, the problem I have with this is not the word abstinence so much as the word only. I, I think that abstinence is fine if that's your choice, if that's if you want to wait or, or whatever. I mean, that's fine. But you do need to know about everything else. Yeah. And I think for most of us, it's an abstinent for now kind of a thing, one sure. day at a time, because things change and people who've been sexually active get back on the wagon and, and uh, go celibate for a while uh, before their next sexual encounter. So abstinence is certainly an option. But apart from that one option, uh, wouldn't it be good for our kids to know what else they could do to protect themselves? Well, and I guess the other thing, back to what you are saying about science, um, in this article I was reading, they said that um, since 1981, the federal government has poured more than $2 billion into abstinence-only education without any proven positive effects, like delaying sexual activity or avoiding unintended pregnancy. Ouch. That would upset any. even an elitist Republican I would who think, was concerned about his financial dollars. I would think a dollars. fiscal conservative would be concerned about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it's kind of crazy that we poured $2 billion into that, although it is a bit embarrassing because we spend over that much per year, I think, on dog food. So <laughs> the idea that we're spending so little on our children's sexual education. But that's not even on education. I mean, what do you... Okay, I'm going to show my ignorance for a moment. What do you learn in abstinence-only education? Like, what are they actually teaching you? Well, one would hope that in an abstinence-based program, they're at least still teaching anatomy and physiology. You know, the mechanical stuff. This is where the, the baby parts. grows. Yeah, this is the part that makes the sperm. This is the part that, well, you know all the parts that you got. So we don't need to get into that. But, you know, you would hope that a student would have all that. Of course, in the, the article you read that, there, there were those students who didn't even catch that. And really what we've done is we've reduced sexuality to pretty much a mechanistic model that this is how babies are made, this is how diseases are transmitted, and so don't do it. And that's the abstinence part. And there's zero component for how to manage one's sexual feelings, how to find the love one needs as one gets older and longs for an adult connection. There's really little insight, and and I get it. I think I think this is happening because it's strange, it's different, and we've never been here before as a species. We've never had the luxury of wondering about sexuality and making choices because so often in the past, women were married off at a very young age and people did whatever they wanted to do and things either worked out or people just lived together miserably and unhappily forever and ever. But Amen. luckily they died young, so. Yeah, and, and that was so much of an option as well. So there were some other big fish to fry, you know, like survival, um, like dealing with being raped and pregnancies that are unwanted and all of that. But, you know, even just the the tedium of eking out a living by scrabbling about in the dirt, you know, to, to raise crops, to feed a family. I think now that there's a certain level of wealth in the world, at least in the Western world, we're kind of wondering how could we be happy, you know, merely than just survive? How could we actually thrive? Right. And you will be shocked, <laughs> shocked, shocked tell you. to know the answer to um, helping our children avoid unintended pregnancies, avoid sexually transmitted diseases. Do you want to know what they, a professor says this, so it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what does that professor you like so much have to say? Professor, Are you dating this guy? Uh, I, no. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Professor David Wiley says, research shows that what does work is to normalize the topic by having direct and comprehensive discussions with young people. Actually, the sooner you talk to kids about sex and birth control, the more information you give them, the more likely they are to wait longer before having sex. And once they do, they're much more likely to use birth control. So what we're doing now with the abstinence-based only program is the opposite. Yeah, well, we're discouraging the conversation, which discourages the amount of thinking which discourages the amount of intelligent managing. 
So it's a pretty simple cascade of dominoes, one, two, three. It's not that complex that even an anti-science uh, Republican couldn't understand it. It's something that every parent could understand. And if they were to put their children first, first of all, some priorities. Don't we want all of our children to have great sex lives in their future? Yes, we do. That's a rhetorical question. <laughs> no, no, number or, or the giggling will do. And number two, to obtain that great sex life in their future, whether it's with abstinence and, and joining a convent or it's marriage and having 100 kids, I think most of us would like to know that our children are going to be able to manage their sexuality intelligently. Well, there's really only one way human beings have learned how to manage things intelligently, and that's through education. Through information. Discussion, talking about things. Well, you know, it's not enough to just have the information because information could theoretically be obtained by reading a couple of internet articles. It's really a, a social process. You know, uh, Jackie, I want to say it's, it's more about wrestling over these terms and conversing about them until I'm comfortable. Because if I'm not really comfortable conversationally, but I have this illusion in my head that, yeah, I know all about that. I read three articles. Right. <laughs> But I'm still not prepared to have a discussion, uh, particularly with a significant other who wants to get naked and have sex and but without protection or is offering protection, but it's ineffectual type of protection. If I don't have a comfort level in discussing that, it makes it really hard to set boundaries, to defend my boundaries, and to set myself up for success. So the social angle on this is something that we never have done. It's not okay for us to talk about sexuality, much less intercourse. It's certainly not okay for us to talk about our libido and the fact that our children have a very normal, this increasingly strong desire for sexual activity and that they need to manage that, you know, particularly after puberty, they need to manage that in a way that really is effectual, that, that truly works for them in the context of their overall lives, their feelings, their beliefs, and everything else. We, we deprive our children of that when we deprive them of a, of a holistic view of sex education. And it's unfortunate, not because it's sad, but because it is ineffectual. You know, it's, it, we keep, when we reduce love to a mechanistic model, our children walk out into the world utterly unprepared. Well, and I've always wondered about this. If your approach to sexuality in young people is shame, you know, that you should be ashamed for even having these thoughts, let alone acting on them, that doesn't just go away when you get married and you're legally allowed to have sex. Right. This horrible thing that you were never supposed to do that's so dirty, you really shouldn't even be thinking about it. Now you can just enjoy it as much as you want. Right. I mean, how do, how do you adjust your head around that? Well, especially when, you know, what we got was this certificate signed by the Justice of the Peace, Bua. And that totally made it okay. That gave us the blessing from on high or wherever to make a formerly dirty, horrible, disgusting thing into a totally wonderful, mystical, magical, and sacred thing. And that's just... That's just nonsense. I mean, no, there's no one who can believe that that is going to be an effective way of introducing our young people to sexual activity. Well, and not only that, but obviously, even if you do wait until you get married to have sex and you do want to have children right away, at a certain point, you're going to want to stop, I would assume. You know, you have your two or three kids or whatever it is. I mean, you're going to need birth control at some point. Oh, phew, for a minute there, I thought you meant stop having sex. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> You might stop having stop babies. Stop reproducing. Yeah, well, you know, all of this, all of it from, from the time our children are very young to the time they decide to stop having babies and beyond, right, until we, we all take our last breath, we're going to be sexual beings. And we try to prepare our children for financial success by talking about money and teaching them lessons about money. We try to prepare them for spiritual success by passing along what we know. And we try to prepare them for career success by sending them off to school. But when it comes to sexuality and family and love and all these things that really make humans human, we don't seem to be willing to prepare them at all because we ourselves are so uncomfortable. And again, the whole idea of um, the more information you have, the better decisions you can make. 
Yeah. The more conversations you have. Yeah. You know, I'm surprised you haven't asked me that question. You always ask me whenever I opine on, on things like this. What would you do right now? <laughs> yeah, right. Because, you know, there's the problem. And, and talking about the problem, I think, is part of the solution. But the idea of what can people do, I think, you know, some of some of what could be taught really could be taught simply by reading. Some other things could be taught by having uh, birds and the bees talks with parents. But I do think there is a place for sex education in our schools because I don't know if you've ever been to an Al-Anon meeting, but I have. And I loved it. It really helped me a lot to go to a couple years of Al-Anon um, coming from my alcoholic family. But one thing I noticed is that I was much freer to express things in the relative anonymity of an Al-Anon meeting than I was, say, going home to talk to my family members who were all living in that alcoholic environment. Right. So, and it didn't matter whether they were drinkers or not. Anonymity is a part of the process of being in a group that can help you. And in the schools, I know that, you know, our young people know each other's names, for example, but there's a certain level of detachment that one has with one's classmates that one does not have when one's parents are in the room. And it's difficult, I think, to talk about certain sexual topics, either in the abstract or in the personal way, when you have a parent figure just hovering right over you. So I see a place for comprehensive sexual education. I hate calling it sex education because it sounds like it's all about intercourse, reproduction, and diseases. And really it's about sexuality and it should be about flirting and about dating and about mate selection. And, and oh, and when is it a good time to break up? And what are the requirements for being in a healthy, abuse-free relationship? There's so many things to talk about that relate to our sexuality, but typically we all tend to make sexual Sexuality about just intercourse when actually sexuality is vast, as is demonstrated in uh, the news. Whether it's politics or what's happening at the corporate level, there's a problem because adult men and women, but mostly adult men, are not managing their sexuality intelligently. Okay, so back to parents oh. and, and children. Yes. I <laughs> don't want you to go all crazy on me on the military, <laughs> <laughs> as you are wont to do. Um, so, you know, and we've talked before about parents talking to their kids about sex and sexuality. And the thing that we've talked about and that I've noticed in my personal life is as long as you don't talk about sex, intercourse, pleasure, you know, all of those things, because that's the thing that will send your children running from the room as fast as possible. But talking about birth control or feelings and things like that, they seem totally open to, which again, I think makes this conversation for parents much easier. Well, I think some parents like yourself might have wonderful success with that. And if you do, God bless you. I think other parents, though, try to bring up even the most non-physical aspect of sex, like say feelings or beliefs around sexuality and their kids are still freaked out. So I like backing up even one step farther where it's really not about my child or me, not regaling them with of tales with my my dangerously uh single single days or anything like I that. I will thank you for them. <laughs> But instead, to simply pick up an article off the internet or the local newspaper or a magazine you're reading, even just one of those little uh, sidebar factoids that they have, like in today's newspaper, there was something like, uh, I think it was 87% of all people admit that finding love is the most important thing in life. Um, but when those things, you know, when we find those things, to just read them without without looking into the eye of our children and just looking, continuing to read and say, well, what do you think of that? And I think when you when you put that out there like that without even asking for a response and, and children are free to respond and say, ooh, that's gross or, well, I don't know about that. It makes it safe for children to talk about sexuality because dad brought it up first or mom brought it up first. So that's uh, that's kind of what I think we ought to be doing. Well, and what I would add to that is, did you know that you can buy condoms now on Amazon.com? So they will send them right to your house, big packages of them. And sometimes deliver them to the trunk of your car. <laughs> that, That's a thing. That, yes, yes. <laughs> but the they big boxes of condoms that you can then separate out and just put in your teenager's bedrooms. <laughs> oh, my God. 
<laughs> no questions asked. And you say I'm controversial. Well, here's the thing is I don't want to... Mom, gross. I don't I, even want to think that you're thinking about me using this condom. I don't want to think about being a grandma of my college and high school age okay, children. Okay, you're willing to buy the condoms? Are you willing to show them with the aid of a banana how to put them on? I don't think they need that. I think they, I, I think sex educators would disagree with you because... I think that that's something that they could learn in sex education. <laughs> <laughs> Not abstinence-based sex education, which, by the way, is something like 94% of American sex education, which is a shameful thing to think about. It's, it's like we've, if we're going to talk about it all, we're really only going to talk about not talking about it. That's crazy. So, all right. So now that I'm super depressed and... Uh... <laughs> So since the we're putting all this money into abstinence-only based sex education, it does put more pressure on you, the parents, to pick it up. And uh, <laughs> I'm assuming that you also, most of you, don't want to be early grandparents. So uh, it's definitely worth having the conversation. Or you could even just have your kids listen to this podcast to get the party started. There you go. Hi, you this go. is Stephen Ng talking with my friend Jackie about, well, I guess we did get around to sex. We did. We did talk about sex and bananas. So uh, thank you so much, Stephen. And uh, we'll talk again. Thank you for listening to Asking for a Friend with therapist Stephen Ng. If you have questions for Stephen, please tweet us at Stephen Ng MFT.